Good morning. Today's text is in Matthew 20. We're looking at verses 29 through 34. So turn there. Matthew 20, 29 through 34. And once you're there, then I'd ask if you would stand in reverence for God's word. And again, once I'm done reading, I'll say these are the words of the Lord, and you will say in the most masculine baritone voice back to me, thanks be to God. Okay? And that's not vain repetition, that is actual thankfulness that God has not left us blind. Matthew 20, 29 through 34. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want for, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And these are the words of the Lord. And you may be seated. A few days ago, I noticed a little stone chip on the door of my truck, and so I brought out my little thing of touch-up paint, and I parked the truck out in the sunlight where I could see well, and I started going half apologetic for pointing them out to me. But the fact of the matter is, those stone chips were there whether I knew about them or not. And they were going to start rusting. Whether I was aware of it or not, the fact of the matter is that they were there. And so she maybe felt a little bit apologetic for pointing them out to me, because of course it's a bit of a disappointment to know that there's something that needs to be addressed. But really, it doesn't change the fact that the problem is there whether we recognize it or not. And so seeing the problem, seeing the issue in our lives gives us the ability to deal with it. And so we need to be eager to recognize our need. We need to be eager to recognize the problems that we have. And I think that's what we see in today's passage. Starting in verse 29, it says that they went out from Jericho and a great crowd followed him. And we looked at this last week. We saw uh, in last week's text that even though Jesus had a a one-on-one conversation with the disciples and with the mother of James and John, it wasn't that it was just Jesus and the disciples. There is a great crowd following Jesus on his last trip into Jerusalem. There's a kingly entourage following him. And he just happened to have this conversation on the side. But they're on their way from Jericho up to Jerusalem, ascending 3,500 feet. It's quite a climb. That's why it always talks about up to Jerusalem. It's about a 3,500 foot climb Uh, over the course of only about 10 to 15 miles. And as they're going up, this crowd following Jesus is growing. And there's energy and there's excitement. And we are priming the pump here for the triumphal entry, which we are going to discover in the next chapter. Things are coming to their final head as Jesus enters Jerusalem one last time. And he has become more and more open in his ministry. You see, in the early days of Jesus' ministry, he frequently tells people, don't say anything about this. Keep it under wraps. Don't share. It's not yet time. Okay? And as Christians, we ought to always be aware of what time is it. How do we live with wisdom? What is it time to be quiet or is it time to shout from the rooftop? And Jesus is moving from it's time to be quiet to it's time for this to come to its final confrontation. And so he is no longer keeping things under wraps. His ministry is becoming more and more open. And so the fact that he is the Messiah King and the Son of God is also becoming more and more clear to those who are with him. He's got this large crowd following him, and we know that some of them are only following for bread. Okay? Some are just following for the party tricks and for the excitement. And, and don't we still have that today in the church? Some people come to church because there's energy, or this is the cool place to be. right? And as soon as it's not the cool place they're gone. Okay? Some people follow Jesus not because they love him, not because they understand what he's doing, but because there's a certain cool factor to it. There's a a cultural cachet to it, or there's a certain energy that they're getting caught up with, but they are not following him for the root of the matter. As one Puritan noted, some are following Jesus for loaves and others for love, right? Alliterated as only a Puritan could. But this is the fact. There's only some that are sincere in their worship of him, and some who are not. And it goes on to say, Behold, there were two men sitting by the roadside, 
And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And here, if you are in critical circles, you will soon find that we have one of these alleged difficulties in the Bible. Matthew has Jesus meeting these men as he's leaving Jericho, it says in verse 29, and Mark agrees with Matthew. Mark also has Jesus meeting this man as he leaves Jericho, but I regret to inform you the Christian faith is about to collapse on all of us, so let's pack it up and go home, guys, because in Luke, it says that he does this on the way into Jericho, so, sorry, church dismissed, okay, that's it, there, there we go, okay. Uh, But there's two possibilities here. One is that these men called out to Christ as he entered the city. And as Jesus frequently did, he likes to go through a time of testing. Jesus frequently does not like to answer people's requests immediately. He wants to see perseverance. He wants to see what is in the heart of a man. And so it could well be that both accounts can be harmonized by saying these men encountered Jesus as he went in. Jesus is playing the long game. Let's see how serious you guys are. And then again, as he leaves the city, they uh, take this uh, request to him again, and he answers it as he leaves. So that is one way to harmonize it. The other way to harmonize this, and I tend to think this one is fairly plausible as well, um, is that this is not exactly the same Jericho that you read about in the Old Testament. Okay? Remember the Jericho in the Old Testament, how it gets left, right? It's not a pretty sight. Uh, and that city got rebuilt about a mile over. Herod rebuilt that city, uh, and this isn't an uncommon thing. If you go from our farm, if you go about two miles south, there is a big rock with a monument there where Blumenort was in 1874. And later on, everyone decided this isn't a great place. We're up against the creek. It's flooding here all the time. Let's move Blumenort. And so Blumenort today is about two miles from where it was many, many years ago. And so after uh, Joshua and the Israelites left Jericho, a heap of ruin, a heap of stone, uh, it got rebuilt about one mile over. And so there's actually two Jerichos about a mile apart. And so it could also be that Jesus is leaving the one Jericho and entering the next, and it's along there uh, that this exchange happens. These are both possibilities, but there is absolutely no need to see a contradiction in Scripture whatsoever. Another thing that critics sometimes point out is that in verse 30, here it says that there was two blind men, and Mark and Luke both disagree with Matthew, and they speak of one man, Bartimaeus, right? Blind Bartimaeus. Uh, And this kind of exchange where there's sometimes two, right? This happens at the tomb of Jesus as well. There's two angels, and in a different account, there's one angel. Again, this really... You have to be looking for problems for this to be a problem, but I will address it nevertheless. Uh, If I would go home today and tell somebody that there was about 150 people at Trinity worshiping this morning, would I be lying? Of course not. Uh, And then later on, uh, maybe on Wednesday, I'm in conversation with someone. I'd say, hey, you know what? Grant Thiessen was in church on Sunday. See, Matt, you lied. Contradiction. (laughs) A few days ago, there was 150 people, and now Grant Thiessen was there. (laughs) This is how far some people stretch to find problems with the Bible. If there were two men there, then manifestly there was one man there. This isn't a problem despite what you might hear. So there is no disagreement ultimately between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their accounting of this situation. Bartimaeus is the name of one of these men. He's probably mentioned by name in the other accounts because he's probably well known to the original audience. But that in no way negates the fact that here we have two men. And it could be that one acts more as the spokesman than the other. That could very well be. But we do not have a contradiction here. The new Jericho, the rebuilt Jericho, became quite a luxurious destination city. It was a a palatial city. Herod had a palace built there. So this isn't just rebuilding an old town and it's just an industrial uh, park. That wasn't it at all. This was an elaborate city. It had a great palace structure around it. And the city had great wealth. And it had a reputation for having plants and doctors who specialized in problems with people's eyes. So if you had eye problems, the optometrists happened to be in Jericho. And so this is also not uncommon that we would find blind people and actually a a, a critical mass of blind people in Jericho because this is where the specialists and these natural remedies existed. And so this could explain the presence of multiple blind men there. And thinking back, of course, in this society, blind people have no way to work and they have no way to care for themselves. 
And so all they could do was sit there and call out on the mercy of other people to take care of their daily needs for them. Okay, so these men, they couldn't work, which means they probably were not well fed. They were not able to clean themselves or to dress themselves uh, or to do uh, many other such things. They would have smelt bad, looked bad, and had an aura around them. And they obviously, in their blindness, could not see Jesus, but they did hear the commotion surrounding him. And they did cry out for God to have mercy on them. And there's several things of note in the cry that they give out. They don't specify what they want. Notice that. They don't specify what they want. They're just asking for mercy. They're not asking for money. They're not asking for healing. They're not asking for food. They're just asking kind of generically for mercy. And they do recognize Christ as king because they call him son of David. Okay? That's clearly a royal title. And it says that the crowd rebuked him in verse 31, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Think of how easy it is to stir up contempt for people you already dislike. Think about that. So you've already got someone in your life that's obnoxious, annoying. You don't want these you know, smelly beggars around you. And so you already have a certain amount of disdain for them. And then they start making a commotion. It's very easy to dislike them even more if you already dislike them. The, you, you find more and more things to criticize in people that you want to find fault with. And so these beggars are being criticized. They're being told to be quiet. Okay? And again, you have these blind men. They can't work. They're not contributing anything to society. They're begging for money so they can eat. They're dirty. They smell bad. They just sit around and do nothing, asking for charity all day long. And they're doing it in your fancy resort city. Okay? This isn't uncommon. People, uh, rich, white People like us, they, we go to Mexico and we go to all these you know, different places on holidays and they clean up a nice area for us to live, right? But that's not how the people there live. That's not how they live, okay? And it's embarrassing and frustrating when the actual real-life people show up at your palatial resort city. That's what's happening here. These people are giving Jericho, this beautiful, nice destination city, a bad name. And they're being told to go back, slink back, into the background. Disappear. Go away. We don't want your type here. But these men are desperate, and they're trusting in Jesus, so they cannot be stopped. Their cry only intensifies as they recognize the kingship of Christ as well as their own need. These men really are needy in every sense of the word. And we know that in the last few encounters that Jesus has had, he's met people who think they are owed something in exchange for what they're able to bring to the table, right? We've had multiple people wanting to negotiate with Jesus. The rich young man wants to negotiate with Jesus, right? I've, I've got all this wealth. I've got all this wisdom. I've got this uh, morally great character. I will give that to you, Jesus, in exchange for the kingdom. And Jesus says, no, thank you. And you you have early morning workers in Jesus' parable that have agreed to exchange a certain amount of work for a certain price, and then they're upset that God gives mercy at the end of that parable to others the same as he had done to them. So Jesus has been dealing with negotiators, and now he's dealing with beggars. And again, right, right at the end of the laborers in the vineyard parable, People are just happy for work by the end of the day. They're just happy that the master has not passed them by. They're just happy to come. They're not negotiating. They just see their need. I need to feed my family. I'll take whatever I can get. Please pick me. And so we're seeing more and more the freedom of God's mercy. God gives grace to whom he wants, when he wants, and how he wants That has been illustrated in an exchange with the rich young man. It has been illustrated further in a parable about vineyards, uh, workers in the vineyard. And now Jesus, being God, he has providentially ordered that now he gets to actually enact in real life the parable of the workers that he has just given by putting some of these kinds of people into the story here. We also had the exchange with the mother of James and John. And their mother misunderstands the nature of Christ's kingdom. She wants political appointments for her son. And Jesus uses the occasion, again, to teach in yet another way that the first will be last and the last will be first in the way that God does things. If you push your way to the front, you can be sure you will be ashamed. Okay, And if you make yourself low, you can be sure that in the providence of God, you will be exalted. And the providence of God has brought about this situation now where there's two men here with nothing to offer, just begging to Christ for mercy. And amazingly, again, 
we, what we see here is that these blind men, this is the providential miraculous thing, the, the, the turn of events in the story. Notice this, they're calling Jesus the son of man. Okay? Blind men are seeing better than the well-positioned followers of Jesus are. That's the twist here. Blind men see more clearly than the people that have been traveling with Jesus. They know that he is the son of David. They know that he is the king on his way to claim his vineyard, to claim his throne. And so it's as though God is saying that if people who are right next to Jesus cannot see clearly enough what's going on, I'm going to put two blind men into this story who can see clearly. They will embarrass those who are well positioned. These beggars know because of their low position that it's all about sovereign grace. They know they have absolutely nothing to offer the king. And even in their cry for help, they are not presumptuous. They're not asking for money or for thrones or for eternal life. They're asking for mercy. It's kind of nondescript in one sense. And so even in this, there's quite possibly an acknowledgement that the son of David knows their need better than they do. It could be that the reason they're just crying for mercy is because they're, they're so trusting of the Lord Jesus that he knows whatever Jesus gives us must be the best for us. That is entirely possible. Perhaps they're so used to asking for mercy that they don't even really understand themselves what they're asking. And you see that frequently in the Bible and probably in your own life, that something comes out of your mouth and all of a sudden you realize what you were thinking. Right? There's sudden clarity when you hear yourself say something. Okay? It could well be that these men are so used to being beggars that they're just saying this and they don't even really understand themselves what they're asking for. But they are going to the right place. Matthew Henry commenting on this, on, on these men presenting themselves to Jesus, says here's that the waterman in the boat who with his hook takes hold of the shore does not thereby pull the shore to the boat, but the boat to the shore. So in prayer we do not draw mercy to ourselves, but ourselves to the mercy. Okay? That's what we're doing when we pray. We're not pulling mercy down from heaven. We are bringing ourselves to the Lord of all mercy. Okay? That is what we are doing. And these men know where to go to have their needs met. They're not treating Jesus like a vending machine. Okay? Frequently people treat Jesus like a vending machine. I'll do this, Jesus, if I get this answer to prayer. I'll do this if. These men are just crying out for mercy. They just need help. Verse 32 goes on, it says, And Jesus, stopping, called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And if you're like me, getting things done is important. I'm sometimes on a mission, my family will attest to. Sometimes I walk with my head down and my shoulders bent forward and I am marching because I love winning. I love getting things done. And the more out of hand my day gets, the more I love taking a W on certain things. I actually will blame my Uncle Steve for that because I remember when I was a kid working for him that he'd march around to the shop and was on a mission. I do the same thing sometimes. I just love getting things done. I am definitely not one of these. It's, about the, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Rubbish. <laughs> it's about getting things done. It really is. Uh, and I'm half joking. Okay. Jesus is on a mission. The son of David is on his way to Jerusalem to claim his vineyard, to claim his kingdom, to claim actually the cosmos. And he's got time to stop and listen to two stinky beggars that have nothing to offer him. Okay, think about that. The son of God stops and takes time for these people. If anyone deserves to be uninterrupted on their mission, it is Jesus Christ. And yet he stops and listens to these men. He hears their request. He knows he's entering his final days on earth. He is ascending up to the city of his grandfather David for his coronation. He's got this great crowd with him, and yet he still takes time for two helpless, blind beggars. And his question may seem odd. Why does he ask them what they want? It's pretty clear what they want. It's pretty clear what they need, and yet he asks them. Okay? And I think, again, for ourselves, sometimes, it's, it's a good practice, often, to write things down or to speak things, because all of a sudden, there's sudden clarity. When you're discussing something, again, you write it down, and it sticks. Or you say it, and it comes out of your mouth, and suddenly there's clarity, even in your own head, about the thought process that you've been trying to work through. There's sudden clarity. And so Jesus is asking them, what do you want me to do? Okay? They've, they've asked generically for mercy. He says, now tell me specifically what you would like. And I think he knows the human heart well enough to say, sometimes, we, sometimes it has to come out of our mouth. Sometimes it has to come out of the tip of a pen for us to even understand our own thoughts, our own desires. And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. 
And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. And this, of course, is the obvious answer. If their, eyes are, if their eyes are fixed, everything gets fixed. If their eyes are fixed, they can work. If they can work, they can get food. Okay? If they can work and they have their eyes working, they can bathe themselves. They can dress themselves. They can do things. So this is the root issue. They need their root issue addressed. And so, of course, this is the obvious answer. And now when they're being confronted, okay, tell me exactly what it is you'd like. They answer, obviously, they answer correctly. But it takes a certain sense of self-awareness to get to that point. They have enough self-awareness that they know better than just to ask for food or just to ask for money or just to ask for a change of clothes or just to ask for a bath. If they ask for any of those things, they're in good shape, again, for another day, maybe two days, but they're in the exact same predicament again. They have the insight. They have the self-awareness to say, we've got to get to the bottom of this. I need my eyes fixed so the rest of me can come along. Then... As now, we probably all know people who are quite content to live in their self-pity. They get used to it, right? Some people, when they experience a difficult providence, become quite okay with just receiving charity for good, finding all the government programs so I don't have to work, so I don't have to do anything, right? Just, just let, let it come to me. I'm just going to sit here, okay? These men are not like that. Had these men asked for money... They would have shown themselves to be the type of guys who'd like to just lay on the ground holding their legs saying, ow, 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 instead of doing anything about it. But they're not those type of guys. They have enough insight to say, I'm not just going to roll around on the ground and say, ow, ow, ow. I need to better my position. And how can I do that? I can't. I'm helpless. I need to cry out to the mercy of the son of David. What they've essentially done in a roundabout way is ask Jesus to give them the dignity of working again. They're asking something dignified. And they see better than anyone else their inability and the fact that, uh, that even their ability to put their hands on something, if they're able to do that again, that itself is a gift of grace. These men are very much the living enactment of the laborers who got hired late in the day. Little to offer, nothing to offer, and yet they're just happy that Jesus did not pass them by. They see this as all of grace. They're in a state of desperation. They know they bring nothing to the table, and they must throw themselves at the mercy of the Savior. These men are unassuming. They're not demanding. They're not trying to negotiate. Rather, they're just overjoyed that Jesus did not pass them by. And by getting to the root issue of their sight, by asking for sight, these men are demonstrating the truth that if we seek first the kingdom of God, what happens? Everything else is thrown in. C.S. Lewis talks about this at length, that frequently we, we misdiagnose our problems, okay, and, and we get misdirected on things that might even in themselves be good, and we get so fixated, and he talks frequently about happiness, right? Have you ever noticed that people in search of happiness never get there? Okay, they never get there. Okay, so they've, they've sacrificed everything for an idol, and not only does the idol never satisfy, and it never does, but they have also lost the kingdom of God. Okay? And when our affections are ordered for what we need, which is the kingdom of God, all these other things come along. The happiness comes. The joy comes. The food on your table comes. Right? If, you, if you aim at secondary things, not only are you guaranteed to miss, but you also will miss the primary things. If you look for the primary things, you get the primary things and everything else is thrown in. Okay? We need affections. We need wisdom to see rightly what our actual need is. Seek first the kingdom of God. The rest of it, you know, take care of itself. Don't, don't sweat it, okay? You, you'll get food. God knows you need to eat. God knows you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God. And so sometimes we are in situations where we realize that we don't get it. Many of you know I can't sing. And I'm in the unfortunate position where I love music. I love it, okay? I love old hymns on a pipe organ. I love classical music, I love classic rock, I love old country, I love new country, I love bluegrass, I love it all. And I can't sing. You can, uh, that's a frustrating situation for me. But at least I have the decency to know that I, I get it, that I don't get it. Okay? We also know people who don't get it, that they don't get it. Okay? And those are the most unfortunate people of all. These people think they're crushing it, and they don't get it, that they don't 
get it. This is indeed a worse situation to be in. People who don't get it that they don't get it just blaze ahead. And their inability and their, the fact that they're blind, it never bothers them. It never phases them. It doesn't slow them down. Okay? It's like the stone chips in my truck that just get neglected. They're there regardless, but nothing fruitful, nothing productive is going to happen if it's never pointed out what the real need is. I can live in oblivion to the rust and it will still do its work whether I notice it or not. Or we can make the difficult admission that there are blind spots in our lives. There are needs in our lives that must be addressed. And so these two men, if you notice closely, it says that their sight was recovered. So it's quite possible that these men were not born blind, but they somehow became blind later in life. So they have the decency of getting it that they don't get it. They remember what it's like to see. They remember that, okay? They get it that they don't get it, which puts them in a great place because people who see that they have a need are able to cry out for help. The rich young man also didn't get it, but he didn't get it that he didn't get it. He was self-sufficient. He was a good person. Okay? He had something to offer Jesus. That's how blind he was. And by doing that, he showed himself to be much more blind than these two were. And in our own day, in our own lives, in our own situations, how many people are so blind that they can't even acknowledge or become aware of their blindness? It was pointed out to me a while back. Think of the people, the kind of people, we maybe talked about this in Sunday school a bit this morning in the education front, but think of the people who are obsessed with controlling the lives of other people. People who want to run bureaucracies. People who want to expand some government program and tell you more compulsory things to do. Almost always, those people's own lives are an absolute disaster. The people who are least able to manage themselves are obsessed with telling other people what to do. It's a bizarre thing. They're so blind, they don't see their blindness. Okay? They're incapable of managing their family. I know. I want to become president. I can't manage my own family. It must be a good idea for me to be a church elder. <laughs> okay? I can't handle my marriage. Put me in charge of something else. It's, it's blindness. It's blindness. Okay? My, my children are a disaster. They're, they're rebellious. They're doing all these things. I should be the principal of a school. Okay? People sometimes get so blind that they don't know they're blind. And these people often get bold and brash about their rebellion against the created order, right? I, I got a snicker during the, when inflation started to be a big problem, and, and naturally, because you print money out of nothing against the biblical wisdom that the king should not put dross in his gold, this is a biblical issue, okay? Who knew that currency policy is a biblical issue, okay? The Bible says that the king shouldn't put dross in the gold because you're going to put too much fake money in the system, it's exactly what our government does. People can't afford to pay for groceries and rent, so how do you solve that problem? Well, we'll create more pretend money, right? We're going to solve this problem by doing more of what caused the problem in the first place. You're, it's a level of blindness that cannot even recognize that it's blind, okay? You don't get it that you don't get it, and so you just keep doing wicked and foolish things, I've shared before, often people who have made the biggest mess of a situation have the most advice for other people, okay? And we need to be quick to recognize our own blind spots. We need to be quick to recognize if, if three people you trust are telling you the same thing, it's probably not the rest of the army that's marching out a step, okay? I've had those moments in my own life. I'm not saying this as on some place of antiseptic purity. I've had moments in my own life, especially when I've been struggling with anxiety and depression. And I was ready to give up on certain things. And my wife and my grandpa and my uncle, whose judgment I all trusted, all told me the same thing, and I could not see what they were seeing. The world looked very different to me. But I just, you know, here's three people that I love. Here's three people that I trust. They're all looking out for me. I will not believe my lying mind now for a little bit. I will throw myself at the trust of these people. It sometimes is that way. 
Okay, if people you love and trust are all telling you the same thing, listen. Don't be blind to your own blindness. The fact that we are born blind and that we have blind spots, we cannot help. But we can receive wisdom from others. We can recognize our need and go to the Savior for help. So many, when we're under the grip of sin, become like these blind men. Or the even more blind men. But these blind men are at least able to recognize the reality of the situation. And this is the occasion. Their, their recognition of their, of their grave situation is the opportunity for Christ to give them the gift of sight. And if we really wanted to push this analogy all the way, and I'm not sure we need to, but if you really wanted to push it all the way, we could say that even their need, even their calling Jesus the Son of David, in another sense, the Holy Spirit had already, prior to that, given them the gift of sight. At least enough sight to recognize who Jesus of Nazareth is. When they call him the Son of David, they are seeing that properly. And that degree of sight is rewarded with more sight. Okay? Obedience is frequently rewarded with more chances to be obedient. Sight is often gifted with more sight. Grace upon grace. Mercy upon mercy. And these men are correct in seeing that they're dependent on Jesus for all of it. Speaking of his conversion, the great church figure Anselm spoke much more humbly than many do about his conversion. Many people approach the Christian faith as though they're going to put God on trial. Okay? I'm going to ask you some questions, God, and if you answer to my satisfaction, I will believe in you. C.S. Lewis talks about this, about putting God in the dock in his apologetics. Put God in the dock. God, you're going in the witness stand, and I'm going to rapid fire you. I'm going to interrogate you. Once you satisfy me, then I will believe in you. Anselm says that's exactly backwards, and it is exactly backwards. He says, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order that I may understand. Okay? Nothing makes sense apart from King Jesus. Okay? So you do not get to put God on trial. God is putting you on trial. Okay? Run to Him. Run to the Lord for the answers, and all of a sudden the world will start to make sense. God is not on trial. You are. Okay? And when we evangelize, when we do apologetics, never leave that part of the human heart unaddressed, that people want to be in charge of their salvation, that they're going to have all their moral problems with God. It, it's the exact opposite. You're on trial. What's God going to declare on you? You don't get to render a verdict on God. You must start by acknowledging your need. You must start by acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and these things will start to make sense. Proverbs 9, 10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that's exactly where these two blind men are. They believed in order to receive sight. Okay? And may we all do likewise. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for these stories that demonstrate in very real terms uh, the situation that we are all in. We all have blind spots. We all show up here blind. We all can't see the back of our head. Lord, we all lack self-awareness. But Lord, I pray that by your Spirit, you would give us the grace of seeing our need, of seeing it that we can't see that we must cry out to you for mercy. We must come to you for grace. And then, Lord, you will reward that with sight. You will reward it with everything that we need. Lord, I pray that we would be a church who seeks your kingdom first, rather than even good things which are secondary. Lord, I pray that most of all, we would be zealous to receive sight, zealous to see things the way you see it, zealous to trust your authority, your perspective on the matter. Lord, and zealous to see what that perspective is as we dig into your word. Lord, for all those who have received sight here this morning, I pray that it would be rewarded with more sight as we read your Bible, as we read your word day in and day out, as we meditate on it, as we come and bring our needs to you. And Lord, if there are some here this morning that don't see it, Lord, I pray that you too would give them sight, give them a heart that can understand the need, give them a heart that is willing to come to you. Lord, we thank you. For this, I pray that your word will have done its work this morning, and I pray that you would continue to sanctify us, give us sight, and reward that sight with more sight. We pray this humbly, knowing that all our needs can only be met in you. I pray this all in the strong name of Jesus, and amen.
please stand with the closing song. I'm so blind, I almost forgot to do something I should have done at the very beginning of the service. Carter and Liesel are engaged. <laughs> they have been for a while, but someone has always been missing. So every week Carter said, don't say it yet, don't say it yet. Finally I got a text this morning, we're all going to be there, can you believe it? And then I almost forgot. But God gave me the gift of sight doesn't hurt that Carter's like six foot seven, so I saw him and it's a natural reminder. <laughs> but now receive the charge. The natural state of affairs is for us to be blind to the things of the Lord. The blindness leaves us idle, unproductive, and unable to help ourselves. While we are all brought into the world in this condition, many never see their need and end up moving into deeper and deeper levels of self-deception and self-destruction. To come to terms with the reality is itself a gift from God. And we just sang my favorite line of all hymns, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear.'" 
If you're scared of God, that's the first gift you get. It really is. While we are all brought into the world in this condition, many never see their need and end up moving deeper and deeper levels of self-deception and self-destruction. To come to terms with this reality is itself a gift from God. The church father Augustine once noted that man does not obtain grace by freedom, but obtains freedom by grace. Like the blind men, we must come to the son of David for mercy, to seek what only he can offer. Elsewhere, he has told us that apart from the rebirth, we can't even see the kingdom of God. Yet when he gives sight, we are not only given the kingdom, but many other gifts added to it. Consider your blindness apart from the Lord, from what he has all saved you. If you have received the gift of sight, then persevere in thankfulness. And if you have not received this gift, then cry out, for he denies no one who comes to him for mercy. And receive the benediction from number 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and go in peace.